Simon, we're live. Hello, everybody. Simon Dixon here, and thank you for joining me for another week on uh, Simon Dixon, my YouTube channel. Uh, today, we're going to do something slightly different. Um, obviously, with Bitcoin being absolutely through the roof today, passing $18,000, a lot of volatility up and down. Um, I, uh, I've tweeted out today that over the years since being involved in Bitcoin, um, from speaking at the first Bitcoin conference to today, I've seen a lot of people get very, very wealthy. And just like the lottery winners, I've seen a lot of people lose it all. Uh, and the reason for that is because it's not often the asset class that makes you rich. It's the psychology that makes you wealthy. So I wanted to do something slightly different today. Um, and I'm going to be covering 10 tips that I've got that I've learned over the years from achieving all I want financially um, and, uh, you know, hanging around with people that have achieved all they want financially. Um, and uh, yeah, I want to give you 10 tips on how to increase your financial IQ. So just before we get started, uh, welcome everybody to the live chat. Um, if you're watching this recording, then you can use the comment section to ask questions. We go live each and every week. We can discuss anything from Bitcoin, the economics, um, investing, money, wherever you want this to go. Um, and uh, let us know that you can hear me okay and where you're tuning in from in the live chat right now. And uh, we'll just make sure everything's going okay there. As usual, Azad is moderating, so he'll be picking out your questions. So he's already picked out some questions. So why don't you ask those questions now that you might have? Um, and the first half of this, we go through the content. And the second half, we pick as many questions as we can get through. Um, and uh, if you're watching the recording, use the comment section and we'll uh, try to pick those out for future episodes. As I said, we go live each and every week. Um, as usual, the usual drill, YouTube really um, getting helping us get more and more people see these videos but what they're using is you saying that you like this video so if you're watching this video please do like it right now or you can wait uh, till the content comes through but like it if you're enjoying it as we go through um, also make sure you're a subscriber you don't want to miss any content uh, there's a lot going on in the in the crypto space in the bitcoin space and the economy and uh, i want to make sure that you're on top of all those changes so hit the subscribe button hit the uh, bell symbol and then you've got to hit all and then uh, youtube will make sure that you get an email each and every time we go live so let's jump straight in with the content um, you know, I think it's uh, really important to look at the difference in how people's lives will be right now. Um, you know, I've always said whenever I end my broadcast, I always say that today is the most interesting time in financial history. And it absolutely is. I've been involved in giving uh, financial commentary for 20 years now. Um, and uh, today is absolutely no doubt the most interesting time. Um, there is going to be a lot of change, and I want to make sure you're on the right side of that. Now, if we look at some of the financial challenges people are experiencing right now, um, one of the things I put it down to is the lack of financial information um, and the ability to take action upon that information. It's one of the main reasons why I decided to go a bit more aggressive on providing YouTube content, um, because I think that... Um, you know, helping people to, if they can make some of those shifts um, in terms of getting the right information flow um, and then also understanding the psychological part of how to actually uh, put this into action to actually achieve all you want financially. Um, and I think people are going to be experiencing very, very different worlds right now. Um, you know, I, I'm not here to uh, brag. I care about people. But if you look at what's happened just this week alone, uh, Bitcoin passing through $18,000, uh, making more and more millionaires, making more and more wealthy people. Um, but I've been telling people to get into this industry since $3. Um, and if you look at my YouTube channel way back at the nine year ago videos from the first Bitcoin conference to when I was being crucified on CNBC uh, for telling people to get in when Bitcoin crashed to $300 um, and consistent the whole way through. Um, you know, some people would have listened to that. Some people wouldn't. What is the difference? Um, well, I hope to cover 10 different points on that. But this week, Bitcoin's gone through $18,000. Uh, from my side, you know, we've had more at banktothefuture.com, more companies reach billion dollar status. We've now had seven to eight. It looks like the eighth company coming through. 
Um, and those opportunities are available. I started Bank to the Future. We've been going for over 10 years. Um, and anyone, you know, any qualifying investor could have been investing in those opportunities. Um, just this week, even today, like Bank to the Future token up 20%. Um, more unicorns on bank to the future.com. Um, and so, you know, these opportunities will exist at the same time. There is so much financial struggle out there right now. People losing their job, um, people doing things the old way and not implementing some of the things. Um, so what I've come to realize is that it's not necessarily the information, but it's what you do with that information. So I'd like to make 10 distinctions in this video. Um, and uh, I, my hope is that this actually prepares people for what I consider to be this, this year started, the Great Depression of the 2020s. Um, a great book on this subject was actually written in the last Great Depression during the 1930s. Um, actually, a, a gentleman called Napoleon Hill spent about you know, a decade or so, and he wrote the book Think and Grow Rich, just by looking at the psychological behaviors of those that were becoming extremely wealthy in the Great Depression of the 1930s. Um, and hopefully we can look at some of those. So uh, recommend that book, book that I read a long time ago. Um, and I, it's one that I probably return to because there's so much to learn. So what I want to cover today, 10 ways to increase your financial IQ. Um, I've been releasing videos to our shareholders at Bank to the Future all this week on the four-part video series. Uh, we're going to be releasing that to the public very shortly. So make sure you're on retirementplanb.com if you want to know exactly how, what I'll be doing to invest in the Great Depression of 2020s. And the whole idea behind that is I'll be taking a million dollars of my personal savings and showing people what I would be doing from today, from scratch, if I were starting again. And really, um, I'll be giving you the mechanics, the strategies, and you can follow along and do exactly what I do which, with whatever amount you choose. Um, and uh, But it's really going to be some of the things that I discuss in this video. There's going to be the difference between whether you do it or not. And so 10 different ways to increase your financial IQ. Very first thing that I did, so um, I was... Uh, the reason I actually got uh, into uh, finance because my father lost all of his uh, money. So my father came from very humble backgrounds. He lived, he grew up in poverty. Um, he got himself to be a self-made millionaire through invest, uh, through real estate markets and flipping properties. And then he lost it all in the stock market because he thought that he could be as good as trader as he was in uh, real estate or property. Um, and uh, the 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 implications and the you know the memories of that uh, were a very very traumatic time in my life. Um, and personally, after getting into going to university, um, trying to start businesses, I got myself in the peak and about a hundred thousand dollars debt. Um, and one of the things that I had to do to turn that around is actually look um, exactly where I was. And so this is the first tip for anybody. Um, and the first thing to increasing your financial IQ is not living in denial. Know exactly where you are right now. One of the things I had to do was I had to write down on a piece of paper everything every single bit of debt, every single bit of credit card, every single bit of loans that I had, every liability that I had. And I realized that I was, you know, $100,000 greater or pounds, sorry, at the time I was, I was living in the UK at the time, but I was a hundred thousand pounds deeper in the debt um, than I did in terms of assets. But uh, I was focusing on building a business at the time. But that very first step is just really knowing exactly where you are. So writing down all your debts, understanding your assets, knowing your exact situation where you are, right, where you are. Uh, the reason why we have to do that is because think of it like a map. Um, if you have a map, there's a few things that you need in order to actually get to where you want to go. The first thing is you need to know exactly where you are right now. So when you pull up your Google Maps, there'll be a blue dot and it will tell you exactly where you are. Well, imagine trying to navigate if you don't know where you're starting. Uh, then you obviously need to know exactly where you want to go. So that's point two of increasing your financial IQ is actually set financial goals. What I've um, learned is that when you actually set your financial goals um, and be very specific about your financial goals, people realize that they don't need to actually take as many excessive risks as they think that they need to take to get to where they want to go. 
Um, what I've what I've discovered from you know at Bank to the Future, we've got one hundred thousand investors that are investing in the future of finance and technology. And uh, one of the things I've seen is that uh, people, you know, when they don't know where they want to go and they don't set certain goals, um, I've noticed that people tend to and investors tend to underestimate what they can achieve in one year. Um, sorry, overestimate what they can achieve in one year, but underestimate what they can achieve in five years. Um, and that's because they simply haven't set their financial goals. They haven't set, figured out what type of returns they need to make, therefore what type of risks they need to make. Um, and therefore they have short-term strategies that drives them into taking all of their Bitcoin and putting it into an ICO or putting it into you know, some kind of uh, get rich quick scheme or something that turns into be a Ponzi scheme or, a, you know, whatever it is, it's because they're driven to that really trying to, you know, make uh, that the, 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 the money as fast as possible. And that tends to come from not setting financial goals and understanding uh, where you need to go to. So first thing for increasing your financial goal is actually knowing where you are. The second is setting the financial goals, which is where you want to be. And those are the two things that you need to know. If you pull up a map, the first thing you do is it drops the pin, says where you are. Uh, then you put in where you, the destination where you want to go, and then it gives you uh, directions and how to actually get there. Um, and so those are really the first two things for increasing your financial IQ. The third thing is um, you'll know that every single person, one thing that you often hear uh, from people, and I say it myself, and I got to catch myself when I do say it, is not thinking that you don't have enough time. Um, the reality is, is that everybody has the same 24 hours in, in a day. Um, some people use that very wisely, and some people don't use that very wisely. And how you use your 24 hours is going to determine your outcome and where you want to go. So one of the things that I've always done um, in my 20-year journey to try to you know, uncover the financial system, learn absolutely everything I can, um, is this concept called net time, which stands for no extra time. And by having no extra time, um, it allows you to do two, three things at, in one go. So if you want to work out in the gym, um, then make sure you're listening to a podcast at the same time. Um, if you're doing certain things, you know, I always liked audio books because it allowed me to do it at the same time rather than just having to read, um, says the guy that hasn't actually done the audio book for my book, Bank to the Future. Um, Got to do that. We'll be on the list to do at some point when we do the next draft as well. Um, but study through no extra time, which means that you've got to leverage yourself. You've got to leverage your time. And whenever you're doing things, figure out how to do two things at the same time. And this is how you get more than 24 hours in the day, because no one else can add more than those 24 hours, but you can do two or three things at the same time. Um, and that's the way, you know, to, to do, you use no extra time um, to actually make sure that you're studying your subject, mastering your subject. Um, if you look at, uh, I think it was uh, Gladwell that wrote the book, and essentially he said that you need to have 10,000 hours into a subject in order to actually master a subject. Um, I think I've done more than my 10,000 hours in Bitcoin um, and finance and economics and all those subjects. But the only way I was able to do that is uh, through, uh, you know, implementing this no extra time principle and making sure I'm doing two or three times um, at two or three things at once. So first thing is making sure you know where you are. Second is making sure you know, you know where you want to go by setting financial goals. And the third is actually, you know, how to get there, which is learning by doing no extra time. Fourth thing is many people use the phrase knowledge is power. Uh, I wish that were true because some of the most academically brilliant people that I know have more knowledge on subjects than anybody, uh, but they never get to where they want to go. And the reason because for that is because knowledge on its own is not power. Certainly knowledge is something that you want to have and you want to accumulate as much of it as you can through no extra time, but only knowledge that you implement and get real experience on is power. Now, many people will watch some of these videos and they'll say, yeah, I know these investment strategies. I know some of the things that, uh, that you're doing. I've heard it a million times, Simon, you're repeating things. Um, but if you're not actually getting to where you want to go, if you're not implementing these things, then you don't know it. You only know it when you actually do it, when you put it into action, 
um, and you actually gain real-time experience. Some of the best experience you will gain in finance is when you lose money rather than when you make money. It's why many people that get into trading, they have a couple of big wins. They think that they're expert traders and then they end up losing everything. That's exactly what happened to my father when he gambled away his whole pension um, and everything that he tried to accumulate his whole life um, in the stock market, getting on the wrong side of boom and bust cycles. So knowledge is not power. Knowledge put into action is power. That's the fourth one. Uh, so make sure that when you learn, you, you make sure you understand that if you actually hear things, unless you're actually doing it, then you don't know it yet. Um, and that's the important thing for number four. Um, something that's worked for me um, and number five is to try on the opinion of others that you disagree with. Now, what I think most people do is they create echo chambers around them, which is where they decide which uh, path they want to go in life or what their ideology is. And then they ignore everything else that, uh, dis that you know, conflicts with their beliefs. We see this a lot. You know, a great example is during this election, um, somebody that is a Republican or a Trump supporter or a Biden supporter or a Democratic, they tune into the TV channel that actually reinforces their beliefs. They hang around in the crowds that reinforce their beliefs, but they never try on the opinion of somebody else. And so what I found is by trying on the opinion of people that I disagree with, um, I actually get a much, much deeper understanding of the subjects matter that I'm trying to um, implement. So when people are very, very critical about Bitcoin, I created the Bitcoin hard talk show. The goal was to actually just have people that are critical about Bitcoin uh, because I want to try on their opinions. I want to see if, um, you know, how they think. And I don't want to do it from the perspective of thinking about what I want to say next or what I think already, because if all I'm doing is analyzing it from what I already know, then I'm not learning anything new. And if I'm not learning anything new, then it's been a waste of time. Uh, it's great for the ego, but bad for your, your increasing your financial IQ. So I always look to try on the opinion of others that I disagree with so that I can deepen my understanding. You get two things from that. You either reinforce your belief um, and come from a deeper place, or you actually uh, learn new things that actually shape um, and increase your financial IQ. So that's the fifth thing for me. Um, the sixth thing uh, for me is being willing to fail. Um, what I learned over the years, over the last 20 years, is that the more that I fail, the more that I'm actually learning because uh, it's only in your deepest moments of failure that you actually learn. Now, here's the difference. Many people fail and then they quit. Um, and that's really the path that most people follow. And that's why people you know, never use failure um, to actually get to where they want to go. But the reality is, is that if you want to get to where you want to go, you're going to get everything wrong the first time. You're going to get it wrong the second time. You're probably going to get it wrong quite a few times. Uh, but the more you fail, the more you learn. The more you learn, the more you react. The more you react, the smarter you become. And so the goal with increasing your financial IQ is actually to do things um, so that you can fail as much as possible and then try something slightly different so that then eventually you become an expert. And really, that is the path. Um, to actually increasing your, uh, not just financial IQ, but IQ in anything you're actually trying to go for. So be willing to fail, get in the game, try things, um, it's really, really easy to just criticize people and be skeptical. It's a lot harder to put your neck on the line, go out there, be willing to fail um, and actually try, you know, and do it and be willing to actually get that wrong and then react, learn, adjust. Um, so that's the sixth thing about increasing your financial IQ. The seventh thing I've covered um, is uh, what I call understanding your reticular activating system, RAS. Um, this is something that was taught to me that when I learned it, it was a real game changer and eye opener for me because I didn't really understand the power of this until it was pointed to me um, several years back. And once you understand this, you'll really start to um, have a, a greater and deeper understanding of why you do the things you do and why you notice the things you notice and why you end up hanging around and the things that you hang around with. 
Uh, the reticular activating system is, is the part of your brain that deletes all irrelevant information and focuses on only the information that you want to focus on. It's actually something that we need to prevent us from actually going insane uh, because there's a million things that you can focus on in one time, but our brain has actually built this amazing uh, mechanism for deleting irrelevant information. So for example, right now you could be focusing on uh, your heart beating, um, a noise that you're hearing and a buzzing noise, um, anything. There's a million things that you can focus on that your brain is already deleting that information right now. Um, I'll give you an example of this. And some of you might have seen me give this example in uh, another video that I did during the first uh, breakout of uh, COVID and the pandemic when there was a lot of fear. You know, I, I was feeling it as well, a lot of anxiety around. Um, and uh, I gave people a, an example, and I think it's worth doing uh, for everybody right now. So I just want to demonstrate this, the, the power of this to you. So um, if you look around the room right now while you're listening to me, so stop doing what you're doing. You might just be listening to me and using some no extra time. But this time, I want you to just focus and not do net time uh, while we're doing this example. Um, and I want you to look around the room and just take a, a look behind you, in front of you, to the left, to the right. And I want you to remember as many things as you can remember that are red. Um, look for maybe there's a, a, you know some fabrics, maybe there's something on your clothes, something on the table, something on your computer, something on the light, something on the wall. Maybe you've got some wallpaper. I want you to really find as many things that you can that are in your room right now that are red. Right, try and remember as many of those because I want you to actually do that. This is part of the test. Um, now I'd like you to actually close your eyes um, and I want you to mentally or even aloud if you want, depending on whether you're on your own or with someone else, I'd like you to mentally shout out um, as many things as you can remember that are green. Now, if you're like anybody else, your brain was searching for everything red um, and you had to really, really think about the things that you could see that were green. Um, and maybe you opened your eyes and you cheated and you started to look around and try and remember some things that were green. But that's exactly what our brain does at all times. The reticular activating system was focusing, laser focused, find red, find red, find red, um, and was ignoring everything green around it. Um, this is the reason why when you buy a new pair of trainers or sneakers, all of a sudden you see everyone else wearing them or you buy a new car and all of a sudden you see that car everywhere, everybody's driving. That car was always there. Those sneakers were always there. Those trainers were always there, but you never noticed them because the reticular activating system was not tuned into what you were searching for. So this is the opposite of trying on things that you disagree with. And this is why people tend to put themselves in echo chambers and not increase their financial IQ because they're always looking for reinforcement of their beliefs and they're searching for things that back up their beliefs and therefore they never end up expanding uh, their mind or their financial IQ. But once you understand that, once you um, understand how your brain works and how the reticular activating system works, you can start to actually find things that you never saw before. You can see opportunities that you never focused on before. Um, and you can really start to enhance and actively decide when am I going to focus? What am I going to delete? Um, and that helps you get to where you want to go and increase your financial IQ. So number seven is understanding how your brain works in terms of the reticular activating system. Uh, number eight, repetition is the mother of all learning. Uh, that's a very old phrase. Can't remember exactly who did it. Probably plagiarizing somebody very intelligent that came up with that. Um, but repetition is really, really uh, the mother of all learning. I am willing to learn again and again and again, even if I mentally think that I know it. Um, unless I'm doing it, I don't know it. So many people that will say, you know, Simon, if you, you know some of these things, but if you're not actually uh, harnessing it, if you're not actually doing it, then you need to relearn it. And you need to remind yourself half the time, you just need to remind yourself of the things that you've forgotten that you already know. So repetition, um, trying things on again, you know, learning things again, recognizing when you're not performing at the level that you want to perform, 
Um, just keep repeating, 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 but always remember as well, like with willing, willing, uh, being willing to fail, that you can't just repeat the same mistakes again. You can repeat the same learning, but don't repeat the same mistakes because you need to adjust um, every time that you fail as well as these come together. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's exactly how we learn, you know, a baby doesn't learn to walk until they keep failing. Uh, they're crawling along and they keep failing and they're crawling along and they keep failing and their repetition and repetition is when they actually start to master it. And all of a sudden it's what's consciously in, um, competent, which is where you're conscious about something and you're competent of something. Um, I was taught a long time ago to um, recognize that there's four different levels that you can have whenever you learn something. Um, the first is what we call unconscious and incompetent. That means that you try something, you're useless at it, and you're not really sure that you um, how to do it. Conscious incompetence. If you take the example that's very easy to remember is think about uh, tying your shoelaces. Um, initially, you had to really, really focus on it. It took all your concentration. You had to tune your reticular activating system. You had to fail. You had to really, really focus in on how to do your shoelaces and you were useless at it. You couldn't quite figure it out. Um, that's because you weren't conscious about it um, and you were incompetent about it. The next stage of learning is becoming conscious and incompetent. Um, that means that you actually know that you need to do something and you know the way to do it, but you're still incompetent at it because you haven't had enough practice, you haven't had enough learning, you haven't had enough direct failure or pain to actually um, do it. So you're conscious, you're aware, you're willing to learn more, um, but you're incompetent at that, at that stage. Uh, the next is actually being unconsciously competent. <clears throat> Um, this is where you start to become, you know, really uh, con uh, competent at something. You can do something really well um, and you don't really need to focus on it. You know, this is the, the, the level that you're trying to get to. Um, and then eventually you can become unconscious and um, competent at something um, or you can become, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> conscious and competent. So going through those different phases is where you need to focus on things, but you do, you initially are useless at it and you don't know that you need to do it. Then you start to actually get good at something um, or and that goes through those different phases. Um, so there's four different phases there. That's number eight in terms of increasing your financial IQ. Be willing to repeat, be willing to learn, be willing to go through that cycle and recognize you're not good at it until you're doing it. Um, number nine in terms of increasing your financial IQ is increasing the value of your network. I was taught a long, long time ago um, when you know I wasn't achieving what I want financially. And one of the examples um, is people look at, say they take, they've always said, look at your network right now Take the five to six people that you spend most of your time with, and if you know their average income, um, you will actually be earning the same income as those five to six people that you spend most of your time with. If you add and increase that network and spend a lot more time, and nowadays it's really easy to do that because of the information age that we live today, but if you spend a lot more time um, with people that uh, are financially, you know, have a high uh, financial IQ, then it becomes contagious upon you. And that directly proportionately um, increases the value of your financial IQ and the value of the financial results that you can achieve. Um, so increase your network. And if you don't have a network, then we're in the information age. Spend more time learning from those that have achieved the results that you want to achieve. Um, choose your mentors very well. Um, you know, there's a lot, the problem with the information age is that you can often end up getting mentoring from people that are actually, uh, you know, they may have become wealthy just out of selling information to you or selling courses to you or selling things like that, but they didn't actually earn their money uh, or earn their financial, like, um, increase in financial IQ doing the things that they're teaching you to do. Now, many, many years ago when I was, you know, really uh, consciously trying to increase my financial IQ and learn as much of these things as I could, um, you know, I had to consciously choose my network. And there are many people out there 
the, uh, they, they got wealthy out of selling information, but they didn't actually earn their money through the same way that they're actually teaching you or mentoring you or guiding you to do. Um, so it's really important to actually only listen. Now, this is a big mistake that I of often make as well, is when somebody is very successful at something, you automatically assume that their information is just as valid in other things as well. Um, and, uh, you know, that's definitely not true. Uh, you know, we are all complete novices and, uh, you know, incompetent uh, and unconscious about certain subjects because there's power in specialism as well. Uh, so always look at what they do, not just what they say. I've often found that people are willing to say things, but then they don't actually do them. You know, the classic example is people teaching you trading or something. They're not actually traders. They just make money out of teaching you trading. Um, so you've got to be very, very aware of those things uh, when you're doing that as well. <clears throat> um, stand on the shoulder of giants. You know, there's, uh, there's people out there that have achieved your result. You may not be able to get them directly as a mentor in your network, but now we're in the information age, you can actually do that. Uh, but always pick the people that have achieved the result that you're actually looking to achieve um, as opposed to, you know, if people are guiding you on investing, make sure that they've made all that, a lot of their money through investing and that type of stuff. And the 10th one, finally, is one that uh, is, you know, a, a part of my ideology, um, which is the concept of financial karma. Um, and so for me, there's a lot of unfairness in the world. Obviously, there are a lot of people that got ahead financially, um, but I don't judge myself just upon how much money I make. I judge myself in the way that I make it too. So for me, um, I truly, truly believe in the power of karma. What you put out there goes around. And I always try to judge myself um, and my yardstick for whether I should be doing things or not doing things uh, based, upon, based upon, you know, karma as well. Um, so for me, it's about financial integrity. It's about financial karma um, and always, uh, you know, thinking about when you do things, what are the long-term consequences of that? And many people in the investing industry, short-term, that's why they always end up chasing um, and not actually getting where they want to go. And so for those of you that might have become wealthy right now through um, being involved in Bitcoin, maybe you watch some of my videos um, maybe you got in earlier or, or whatever that is, uh, whenever you got in. Um, remember that once you make money, it's all about how you protect it, how you preserve it. And that's why lottery winners, they have shown statistically that those that win the lottery, approximately 80% of them within two years are in the same financial position that they were before they won the lottery. And that is because they got the wealth, they got lucky, and they didn't increase their financial IQ. They didn't learn how to protect it. They didn't learn what to do with that. So there's several lessons that we all need to learn. Um, one of the lessons on top of these 10 is that um, everybody needs to spend less than they earn, invest the difference, and pay yourself first. Um, and by that concept, I mean what most people do is they're always looking to decrease their debts. They're always looking um, to, you know, they, but they never actually pay themselves first and then use that money to actually build wealth so that then they can later um, be in a position to pay off all those as well. Um, so one of the things that I had to do when I had that crippling debt, and I'm sure there's many people in those situations right now, is I had to make the decision of how much of that money was I going to keep for myself and I was going to use for building assets. And hopefully those assets would grow one day to the point where I could actually pay off the debt. And that's exactly what ended up happening. So when I went to that very first Bitcoin conference, um, you know, that was actually on my last credit card debt at the time because I was trying to build a business. Um, and, uh, you know, <clears throat> um, I ended up paying myself first, even though I owed a lot of debt. And the asset that I happened to get into was Bitcoin. That appreciated. I started making sure that I got more and more knowledge about the industry. Um, and then I started diversifying across into investing in many of the companies that built the industry continued growing the business, uh, Bank to the Future. Um, and as the portfolio grew, make sure I was putting more and more into um, investments, thinking long-term, 
um, and uh, always looking at increasing that balance of assets. Um, <clears throat> so, and then what I would always do, remember currency is not money. I remember many people I use this make the mistake all the time when I'm discussing money and currency. Um, you earn, you tend to earn currency and currency always goes down in value. So if you're looking at saving in currency, you're in the rat race, you'd find it hard to get out of that. Um, because you've always got to put it into an asset that acts more like money. Um, in that sense, that's gold, that's Bitcoin, that's silver. And there's many of the things that I'm going to be teaching in the four-part video series of exactly if I were starting again today, exactly how I build the portfolio. Now, today, I just really wanted to focus on the, psych the psychology um, because I know that we can give you strategies and I will in that four-part video series on retirementplanb.com. It will all be mechanics. It will all be strategy. It will all be what I'm doing. But I also know that many people will watch it and it will make zero difference in their financial IQ or what they actually do. And that's because some of the 10 things that I'm discussing in this from my personal experience that becomes the difference between those that can, those that don't, and those that do. Um, once you've got that, there's lots of things that you need to get, uh, you know, improve in terms of the mechanics. Um, you know, that's where it's about uh, learning how to make more money through investing, um, learning how to actually uh, protect your money through tax um, positions, through legal planning, through inheritance planning, um, budgeting your money, knowing how to actually make it so that you get those assets, learning how to leverage your wealth and assets, um, and making sure that you're getting access to the information that you need. Those are all strategies. Those are all mechanics. I and mean, those are all things that uh, everyone should be learning. But from my experience, it's those 10 things that I gave, which are the tips that I would give to people about increasing their financial IQ. So at this stage, Azad is going to pick out some questions. I'm going to give a quick recap of those 10 points. Um, the first one is know exactly where you are in terms of where your financial situation. The second one is to set your financial goals so that you can then determine exactly where you want to go. The third one is to study and increase your financial IQ through no extra time, which would help you figure out how to get there. The fourth is that it's only knowledge put into action that is power, because until you actually cognitively experience um, the what you're doing, then it won't be knowledge at that stage. Um, try on the opinions of others that you disagree with so you, you can increase your financial IQ. Be willing to fail more, learn more, and adjust. Um, understand that your reticular activating system is, delete, is, de, is deleting the information and learn how to power that um, into your favor rather than unconsciously. Um, repetition, number eight, repetition is the mother of all learning, recognizing that you don't know it until you actually do it um, and be willing to repeat until you're actually doing it. Um, nine is to actually increase the value of your network uh, so that you can learn more stand on the shoulder of giants, get better mentors. And finally, 10 is to implement some financial karma into life. Think about the long-term consequences of what you do. Um, and integrity is what gets you there. The rest is just mechanics, things that you can learn in your net time. So I'm very curious about what you thought of this content. If you enjoyed this content, please do like. It's different to what I normally do. I'm normally just discussing you know, the economics, Bitcoin, money, investing, um, and uh, how you can actually do that. But I just wanted to do that because I really know that this is going to be the difference between people that are using this situation um, to uh, you know, not really take advantage of some of the financial um, interesting opportunities that exist today as well. So like this video if you enjoyed that um, and let me know in the comments section and we'll take some of your questions right now. So Azad, what have you got for us? Yeah, we have lots of questions um, around this topic. Very interesting one. So I don't know how much time we've got left, but hopefully we can get through 20 minutes. <laughs> yep. Uh, right. Let's begin with, okay, can you build wealth with 500 pounds a month? So there's a lot of questions around passive income and how to build that. Absolutely. Um, there's uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, if you th That is the key to just firstly 
uh, determining how much you can put aside, understanding your financial situation, and then putting together a long-term plan. Uh, so when I release the four-part video series, Retirement Plan B, um, one of the things I'll be doing is taking a million dollars of my personal savings. But the other things I'll be doing is starting with zero savings, um, a regular income, and showing exactly how I would do that. Um, and you'd be surprised uh, at what you can achieve with 500 pounds or, or dollars or whatever it is a month for you um, and pay, paying yourself first. Next question. Okay. Right. Uh, can we get an income from BTC Holdings like we can with staking Ether? Uh, yes, you can if you're willing to take counterparty risks. So there's a whole industry built around um, lending your Bitcoin out, uh, but you'd have to actually put it in a centralized service. There's decentralized services coming through. One of the things you can do is you can take your Bitcoin and you can actually wrap it um, on the Ethereum network and take advantage of all the DeFi um, stuff. Now, that's a very advanced strategy. So it's absolute buyer beware. Um, you're going to have to uh, really start with the basics. So if you're asking those questions, um, you may not be at the stage where you want to take advantage of some of these more advanced strategies, but there is um, a, an opportunity cost uh, to doing that. And that's why you can earn returns, uh, but you can't, it's not a proof of stake. Uh, Bitcoin works off uh, proof of work, which is mean that people are burning electricity and mining in order to receive new Bitcoins. Ethereum is the same at the moment, uh, but it's currently trying to switch to proof of stake, whereby if you can lock up a minimum of 32 ETH, then you can actually receive returns. Um, but yes, you, you certainly can. And in video three of the four part video series, I'll be going through some of those more advanced strategies. Next question. Okay, the next question is something uh, similar to what I've asked you uh, previously. It's around P to Schiff. Um, so we're getting a lot of questions around that. Um, and you have been following him quite a bit as well. So Simon, have you listened to Peter Schiff's arguments against Bitcoin? He thinks in the, it's in a major bubble. What do you think? Uh, do you think he's incorrect? And somebody said Peter Schiff has uh, regarded Bitcoin as investing in tulips. Uh, yeah, and he can keep saying that. He's been saying that for 10 years and he'll say it for another 10 years because it's outperformed gold. Um, so the the reality is, is that gold is a great store of value for preserving your wealth, which is Peter Schiff's favorite asset class. And in video two of the four part video series, I will answer that very question because um, I'm going to be going through some of the things that you're going to be here from very well known, very bright, very intelligent people that I would consider mentors in certain subjects. Um, but in terms of Bitcoin, Peter Schiff's not one of the guys that I would be listening to. However, Bitcoin is in a bubble. Bitcoin always goes to bubbles. Bitcoin is the pump and dump um, machine. But the long-term fundamentals are never in a bubble because the reality is, is that Bitcoin is in the right side of several trends. Bitcoin gives you the ability to own your own money. People want to own their own money. Bitcoin gives you the ability to spend your own money peer-to-peer. -peer. People want to spend their money peer-to-peer. -peer. And Bitcoin has a fixed supply. And each year, more and more people find out that the utility of Bitcoin increases for them. And because there's only ever going to be 21 million of them, then the only way to get them is to be willing to pay a higher price. Is why it's been the highest performing asset class for 10 of the last 12 years. Now, obviously, the future does not equal the past. I cannot give you financial advice. Um, but, you know, the all of the arguments that Peter Schiff says say that Bitcoin's in a bubble is because he is focusing on the short term, not the long term. And Peter Schiff knows very well that discussing short-term bubbles is not a reflection of the long-term. Now, Peter Schiff stuck his knee in the ground. His reticular activating system is in full swing. Um, and the arguments that he gives is nothing that we have. Peter Schiff has said nothing unique about what's wrong with Bitcoin. In fact, it's pig ignorant arguments sometimes. Um, he says that the supply is not fixed uh, because there's millions and millions of other coins. So far from the truth. Um, but I'll cover a lot more on this in, in video two. Um, <clears throat> there are genuine criticisms of Bitcoin. There's still risk in there. That's why asymmetric return opportunities exist. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Um, you know, there are genuine things like uh, could all governments make it uh, illegal? Yes, they can. Covered that in other videos why I don't think that will happen. Uh, could quantum computing actually be uh, something that uh, interrupts the algorithm? Answer that last week of what I think would actually happen. Um, and, uh, you know, is it energy efficient? Yes, it is. Um, but, you know, all of these different arguments that people tend to come up with, um, they there's nothing unique about what Peter Schiff uh, says about Bitcoin. Um, and each time Bitcoin has actually proven uh, that it gets through many of these challenges as well. Uh, so at this stage, Bitcoin's seen every every criticism. It's got through every criticism, um, and uh, you know there's 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 nothing new to criticize Bitcoin for. Um, but you can just wait until Bitcoin actually becomes a store of value, like gold. Um, in which case, there'll be no longer to, uh, opportunities to increase your wealth as through, by investing in a speculative store of value, because at that time, it could just be a store of value, which is not about increasing your wealth like gold. It's about preserving your wealth. Um, and uh, I'll be guiding people and helping people understand how I think about Bitcoin, gold, uh, stocks, different asset classes um, in that, in that four-part video series. And I will cover this very subject uh, on Peter Schiff and what I think some of the things he got wrong. But is he right? Yes. Is Bitcoin in a bubble? Yes, it's in a bubble. It pumps and dumps like crazy, but it's short term. And I don't really give a damn about the short term. I'm here for the long term. Um, and I've got my plan. I know where I am right now. I know where I want to be. Um, and it, it, it just doesn't affect things. And based on that last statement that you've made, somebody asked, um, should you have an exit strategy from Bitcoin? If so, what is your Bitcoin exit and sell strategy? Um, I don't look at Bitcoin as an exit strategy. I think about if I, if I have Bitcoin, what do I want to buy? Um, and I could buy some gold because I want to preserve some of the wealth. I could buy uh, dollar-denominated assets in a traditional portfolio because I want to reduce some of the risk. Um, but Bitcoin to me is not an exit strategy. I want to take currency that I might earn or I've earned in any other way. I want to get it into money, um, which uh, you know dollars are not money. Um, you know, Bitcoin, gold, silver, these are forms of money. Um, and then I want to have a diversification strategy to pre pre to prepare for the different outcomes. Uh, do I know when I buy Bitcoin and when I sell Bitcoin? Absolutely, it's 100% defined. I don't give a damn what happens in the market. Uh, that's defined so that I can take out many of the emotions into it and just focus on what does make a difference, which is some of the financial IQ things I covered today. Okay, we've got a lot of people in uh, joining us today who aren't aware, probably might not be aware that you are the co-founder and CEO of Bank to the Future. So we've got quite a few questions around Bank to the Future. One of them is, how do we get into Bank to the Future? And how will Bank to the Future benefit from central bank digital currencies? Uh, so banktothefuture.com is a, a, a place where you can invest in the stocks and shares of financial technology companies and Bitcoin companies. Um, we've done funding rounds for over a hundred different companies, um, from companies that were, you know, whether it be, uh, giving opportunities like comp huge companies now that were very tiny at the time, like Coinbase, blockchain.com, Kraken, Bitstamp, Robinhood, Bitfinex. Um, you know, we were in, we were giving people opportunity to invest in these companies before any venture capitalist was interested in investing, uh, before our industry had a reputation. Um, and so it allows people to build a diversified portfolio in financial technology companies and co-invest in some of the things that I might be investing in um, and, uh, you know, uh, build a diversified portfolio. Um, because these are securities and private equity is restricted by regulations um, to certain types of investors, it depends on your country uh, whether you can invest in such opportunities. Um, and so the, if you register at banktothefuture.com, it will tell you whether you qualify to invest in your country. Um, and that is 100% based upon the regulations in your country. Uh, so that's what uh, Bank to the Future does. Um, and uh, what we noted over the years is that while we provide the ability for people to buy uh, stocks and shares in financial technology companies, uh, most people don't have the strategies, don't have the, 
you know, the, the, the actual approach. So that's why we created this whole retirement plan B concept um, so that we can actually give people, you know, the, 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 the strategies, the approaches, the long-term thinking of how to actually see where stocks and shares in private uh, financial technology companies might actually fit in with their uh, longer-term goals, uh, financial plans as well. Because uh, we found that very few people actually prepare this stuff, that's why I wanted to create that the the, the free video series, so that people can use uh, this uh, what I call the Great Depression of the 2020s to actually try and get on the right side of this. Um, and uh, I'll be sharing exactly what I'll be doing. Simon, do you do one to one consulting? Uh, no, I need to leverage my time a lot more, unfortunately. So um, one thing I will be doing uh, probably one time is uh, actually putting together the Retirement Plan B online coaching program. And the reason I do that is because I just wanted to um, get all of the information, the best of what I've learned over the years into one membership site, um, work with a group of early adopters and uh, uh, people that want to work with me to build that program. Um, and then when people want to use it, they can just uh, access that online program because unfortunately, I've got to be smarter with my time. And if I, I, I've i got no time for doing one to one, I want to have much bigger impact, much more leverage than that. Um, but uh, we are looking at building out a private client service um, at Bank to the Future as well. Um, so, you know, uh, the team that have all been trained in many of the things that I do. But no, um, unfortunately, it's just not something I can do. Um, I like to have much more, you know, wider impact. Um, you know, for, for many years, the most frustrating thing, the reason I came out more on YouTube recently uh, is because for years, you know, over the last decade, I was only ever working with high net worth individuals uh, through Bank to the Future. Um, but now I want to have a bigger impact. And now all the tools exist for wherever you are, whatever your starting point is, um, all those tools exist thanks to, um, some of the, the financial technology has been built over the years. Um, and so I want to make sure that more and more people can uh, have access to those tools and, you know, the tools used by the wealthiest 1% that, um, but yeah, what one-to-one co co consulting is not at my stage of life, something that I, I want to, or need to do. Okay. Room for two more questions, Sai, and then we wrap up. Okay. Let's do it. All right. So we got one, um, Oh, by the way, we've got 734 people watching right now. So um, Simon's YouTube channel is uh, up 53,000 subscribers. We want to increase Simon's Twitter followers as well. So we've received one tweet. Um, uh, so that I'm going to answer that. So anyone who wants to follow Simon on Twitter is si at Simon Dixon Twit, T W I T T. So the message on Twitter. Is high as I've got one question for Simon. Risk of dominance of China in Bitcoin mining. They control 65% of mining hash power. Can China pull the plug on these miners by stopping to provide them the required cheap electricity? Uh, can China do that? Yes, they can. Um, and will they move somewhere else? Yes, they will. <laughs> um, so, you know, Bitcoin is very resilient to these attack vectors. So the, 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 the sooner you get the attack vector, the sooner you realize how resilient Bitcoin actually has become. Uh, so I've invested in different mining companies that look to geographically diversify that. Um, you tend to, yes, the China has been the dominant uh, country for, in terms of private individuals and companies mining Bitcoin. Um, but there was also Bitfury doing it in Europe and uh, Blockstream now doing it in Canada. Um, different companies that I'm also shareholders in are uh, doing it in America in different geographical uh, locations. So if you were to have a China crackdown um, on Bitcoin mining, then some of them would either uh, end up uh, you know, disappearing into some prison in China or relocating away from China, or you'd have a big decrease in the hash power, which would drive many of the institutions uh, like Fidelity and the uh, different institutions. And um, it would create a ginormous opportunity for people to mine Bitcoin. Um, and then we get more geographical diversification, um, but it's becoming more and more institutionalized as a business. Um, so the, the China criticism has been there uh, from approximately 2013, when uh, many of the larger companies started to get into mining Bitcoin. 
um, uh, benefiting from those cheaper electricity. Uh, but also ever since uh, 2013, uh, China's been flip-flopping back and forth. Um, and every time they try to crack down on Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin tends to go up afterwards. Uh, that's, that's That's been the historical precedent. I was actually in Shanghai um, on a boat when uh, Bitcoin was, I think it was $3,000 when uh, China, the Chinese government said that uh, they're going to uh, you know, take out all the Bitcoin exchanges. Um, and the effect of it is it immediately crashed and then went up to five, six thousand um, dollars So, you know, we've, we've already seen that these effects that make things more scarce um, and make Bitcoin stronger. Again, it's all about people focusing on the short term rather than long term. And that's what people get. That's why people get wrecked, uh, because they think that they can trade these short term trends. Uh, but that's why you know people have been accumulating lots of Bitcoin uh, from from those that are the weak hands, as it were. Okay, um, so one final question. But uh, before I do that, uh, people are asking about retirement plan B. I think you've mentioned it, um, so they just want to know when is that going to get launched. And the final question I'd like to put is: if there's a single book you can get the entire population to read. What would that be and why? And your final thoughts, Simon. Okay, you, you, one question, but you gave me three. Uh, yep, so let's so do them all. So when is retirement plan B? Uh, so if you're a shareholder at, uh, of Bank to the Future, our actual company, our parent company, BF Global, then you would have received an email and you'll be consuming those videos now. Um, we'll be giving you the final video uh, later towards the end of this week. Um, for those of you that are not shareholders, then once we processed a lot of the feedback, and the feedback has been immense, thank you, thank you, everybody, um, and our shareholders that uh, have been giving all that feedback. Um, we, yeah, we really appreciate that, and it's so grateful to see uh, the the how how impactful it's actually been. Um, yeah, we'll we'll be in processing some of that feedback, and uh, maybe in a couple of weeks, I, I think we should be there. I'm reluctant to give an exact date. Uh, but uh, we, it, it's, it's in motion. Everything's going the way we want it to go. Uh, and we'll just uh, make some changes based upon the feedback that our shareholders have given us. Uh, second question. Um, yeah, sorry. If you want to actually be first outside of our shareholders to receive a notification, go to retirementplanb.com, enter your name and email. Uh, you have to check it, confirm the email, and then we'll make sure we rush those out to you. Uh, if you were to read one book, uh, I don't think I can nail it down to one book. Uh, maybe in a future video, I'll cover a group of books, but there's so many great books out there. Um, it, it depends what I'm really focusing on and, and I'd have to get a bit more specific. Um, but yeah, there's uh, there's maybe I'll do a whole section on, on just that topic and what different books I recommend for different things. Uh, but there's so many great ones out there. Okay. Uh, was, was there a third part to the question? Well, then? the third part, I guess um, it's your your final thoughts. We've got two minutes. Um, yeah, I mean, so I guess my final thoughts are congratulations to everybody that uh, has been experiencing some of the gains as a result of being um, involved in Bitcoin. Always remember, after many of these pumps comes dumps, and many people, here's the most consistent thing I've always heard ever since three dollars have i missed the boat um and people have been telling me that three dollars have i missed the boat one dollar have i missed the boat thirty dollars have i missed the boat a hundred dollars have i missed the boat a thousand dollars have i missed the boat five thousand dollars have i missed the boat fifteen thousand dollars have i missed the boat twenty thousand dollars missed the boat back down to three thousand have i missed the boat um i've just been hearing that you know consistently um ever since being involved um, and the reality is, if you are trying to do market timing and be a trader, make sure that you are a professional trader because everybody gets wrecked trading. Uh, from the days that I worked as a market maker in the investment bank, I've seen that. Um, and from all the things that I've seen over the years as well. Uh, there might be a 10% out there, but you tend to get wrecked from the insiders that are manipulating these markets. So do remember um, that these bubbles and dumps um, a very natural behavior. And uh, if you're trying to actually uh, get into these things short term, expect big corrections, expect, um, you know, things, but you're going to have to think about better strategies. Um, and that's what I'll make sure that I cover on retirement plan 
Com. So thank you all very much for that. Um, if you've watched till the end and you haven't liked and you enjoyed the content, do me a favor, like this video so that we get uh, more people watching the recording. Uh, please do share it, share it on Twitter. Uh, let me know what you think at Simon Dixon Twit on Twitter. I do read my tweets. So please let me know what you think. And remember to subscribe, hit the bell symbol and hit all. Um, and then YouTube will notify you. Uh, so remember, no matter how bad it gets, you are alive at one of the most interesting times in financial history. Some will get hurt. Others, it will be the best financial time of their life. I want you to be on the right side of that change. Um, thank you, everybody. And I'll see you this time next week. Peace, everybody.